Hello and welcome um, to our last Hungry for History um, for this year, but the first one that's completely live streamed. Um, so thank you to everybody who's joining us. Um, it actually works out very well because if we were outside, we would have gotten rained on. Um, so we're glad to be here online today. Um, so we're already thinking about next year's topics and events. If you have someone that you know that you'd love to hear speak or a topic that you'd love to hear presented, um, let us know. Uh, we're already working that out, so keep an eye out uh, for our next year's schedule. Uh, but today, we are very happy to have Mr. Sean Duffy, um, the Programming Director at the Ohio County Library, and he is going to be talking about the Benwood Mine Disaster of 1924. Um, so with that, I'll give you Mr. Sean Duffy. Hello, uh, good afternoon. I am Sean Duffy and I am the programming coordinator at the Ohio County Public Library. I wanna thank Cockaine Farmstead and especially Kara <clears throat> for inviting me this afternoon. And uh, we'll go ahead and put the slideshow up, if you will, Kara. Thank you. So as I mentioned, I am uh, the programming coordinator, so I'm gonna promote a couple of my programs. Uh, for instance, this evening on um, People's University live stream at 6.30 p.m., we're continuing with the struggle for women's rights at, um, and Joyce Salisbury, who does great courses about the most powerful women in history, will be there this evening. On Tuesday the 1st, which is Walter Ruther's birthday, you can see Walter behind me along with Mother Jones, the miner's angel. Uh, we will do a program with Nelson Lichtenstein. He'll be coming to us on live stream all the way from California where he is a professor. And he wrote the um, most important perhaps biography of Walter Ruther. And you'll also see a video tribute to Walter for his birthday that we created. On the 5th, we will have our fourth Ruther Pollock uh, Labor History Symposium Solidarity Against Hate is our theme. And we have an array of great speakers for you that day, starting at 11 a.m. with Dan Graff from Notre Dame. We'll have Mike Stout from Pittsburgh, who's an activist who's written a book. Chuck Keeney is one of the founders of the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum. And Cicero Fain will talk about black life in Huntington. As Kara mentioned, I am a local history specialist, which means I do a lot of research about local history. But for this topic, I'm definitely second string. Uh, the first string, the best person to do this would have been Joey Telatochi. You see him there up in the upper left, whose great grandfather, Ist von Vargo, was one of the 119 souls we lost that day in 1924. Uh, Joey's unavailable, so you'll, you're stuck with me. I will do my best. And if I make any mistakes, uh, either in the interpretation or in the pronunciation of names, I apologize in advance. Joey did our Lunch with Books program back in 2011 at the library, and um, he's worked for many years on uh, getting the names right of the 119 who were killed. Um, the names are frequently wrong in the newspaper. He did a lot of research to get the record straight and helped create the memorial that you now see at Box Run, and we'll talk more about that later. Here he is with his father, who also helped with the memorial, and they were made history heroes together. I interviewed Joey for the book you see on the left there, which was called The Wheeling Family, Volume 2. Uh, and it's the second book of immigrants that I did to the Wheeling area. And Joey's family's in there, as is a lot of what you're going to hear today. I also want to mention Hal Gorby's book, Professor Hal Gorby wrote and worked for many years on Wheeling's Polonia, which gives you a lot of good information about the uh, mine disaster in the context of immigrant life in uh, South Wheeling and Benwood. If you're into local history, we have a site called archivingwheeling.org that I invite you to take a look at. The story on the Benwood mine disaster is one of the most uh, read stories that we've posted, but we have many other things about Ohio Valley history uh, and archival sources. Now, I mentioned that um, I don't really have a direct connection to the mine disaster like Joey does, but I do have a very strong interest in the topic because this, uh, this is Vincenzo Forlini, who was my great-grandfather and was killed 
any mine disaster in Benwood in the Hitchwood, Hitchman mine, and Coke mine, in 1922, so two years before uh, the one we're going to talk about today, he was uh, crushed under a fall, and he lived in uh, Benwood with his brothers uh, Giuseppe and Matteo. They can be seen in this picture on the left, as can my grandfather Rocco, who was four years old at the time. And to me, this picture has always foreshadowed the sort of uh, the mo the best known picture from the mine disaster that we'll look at later. Uh, and so that's my connection to, and there's a close up, but it's just a very dramatic picture that's always haunted me. Um, just to set the time, the uh, zeitgeist historically in April, 1924, Adolf Hitler was found guilty in the beer hall putsch. Uh, a man named Frank Capone was killed in Chicago. He was a 28 year old brother of a better known gangster named Al Capone. The first book of crossword puzzles was published. Excuse me, the Dawes plan was introduced to try to restructure reparations for Germany. So all these things sort of set the tone for World War II. Tornadoes, a lot of storms at the time. We're having one brewing today. One is, uh, uh, I wish those people well in the path of this hurricane. But in that, in 1924, tornadoes in the South killed 110 people. Actor Marlon Brando, baseball star Gil Hodges, and musician Henry Mancini were all born April 1924. Calvin Coolidge was the president, and Pope Pius XI was the Pope. By 1924, Wheeling Steel Corporation was the biggest employer in the Upper Ohio Valley. It uh, had merged in 1920 numerous uh, companies, including nail works, corrugating plants, blast furnaces, open hearth works, tin mills, tube works, uh, skelt mills, sheet and fabricating, and of course, they had coal mines for virtually each one of those to fuel everything. Down in the southern West Virginia coal fields, where Mother Jones made her mark, uh, the largest labor uprising in American history had taken place the largest uprising of any kind since the American Civil War, the Battle of Blair Mountain, had ended in defeat for the coal miners. And the United Mine Workers of America Union uh, basically was on the run after that. We did have the United Mine Workers here in the Northern Panhandle, but they were badly weakened here as well. This publication is from 1920 that shows the local union 788 in Benwood. And, uh, so just four years earlier, the mine workers were strong, but by the time of the accident, we won't hear them mentioned much at all. So what did coal mining look like in 1924? Well, this publication is called From Mine to Market, and it is the Wheeling Steel publication, so you'll see a lot of the same mines. And it was published in 1926. You can see the electric cars there on the right, and there's a closer look. This is the same kind of car that would have taken the men uh, of the Benwood mine to their place of work that morning. Here you see a man mining coal. This is in Steubenville. Here's another picture from Steubenville with two miners who are drilling a hole so that they can blast the wall to loosen the coal. And here's a, a, a great map, an overview of the area of Benwood that shows you all of the mines. Way up there at the top right, the gold arrow you see, is where the entrance to the uh, the Benwood mine was, and you can see it here in the close-up. So it just gives you an idea of the scale of the mining. Here's an overview of the entire Wheeling Steel Corporation mine, and the arrow shows you the eight north section, which is where the explosion would occur that we're talking about today. Here's a close-up showing eight north. And this is from a publication called Coal Mining Investigations, U.S. Bureau of Mines from 1924. Here's a diagram showing you inside a much smaller view of North 8. Uh, and the newspaper that day, uh, April 28th, 1924, 
was a Monday. So we were coming off a weekend, uh, which would prove to be fateful for a lot of people. And it was pouring rain, as it may today. In Benwood, it was pouring rain. And the newspaper, as you can see, was full of stories about the upcoming election for national, state, and district offices. Um, an 82-year-old Albert Fortney, the last working blacksmith in Wheeling, was killed in an automobile, hit him when he walked into the street, which is kind of ironic. Uh, Klansmen had gathered at a church in Elm Grove, which was significant enough to make the newspaper. Uh, young um, Joseph Donovan of Benwood, this was the news in Benwood that day, had died of appendicitis. Steel production in general was on the decline, as was production of coal. At 6.30 a.m., the 28th of April, 1924, that Monday morning, the morning shift started at the Wheeling Steel Corporation uh, mine in Benwood, a 60-year-old three-entry room and pillar mine. It was newly mechanized uh, with electric uh, cars, as you can see here. Men made their way to their stations on these, and they were taken miles underground, as we'll see. Here's a diagram of the section where the explosion occurred. As the Federal Mine Bureau would later describe it, the interior of the mine is a big city. It is laid out with main streets and avenues and the cross streets running off the avenues. Main, uh, running off the main avenues will be found alleys and off these alleys will be found the working rooms in which the men dig coal. But this mine had a questionable safety record. There had been a gas explosion just a year prior that killed three people. So an air shaft was added at Brown's Run, and this will become a big part of the story, which you'll see later. But ventilation in this mine remained an issue despite the addition of the air uh, shaft. Methane was thought to be at low levels, so the company used safety lamp, open safety lamps, meaning that even a small uh, fall of slate could trigger a methane explosion. Two fire bosses had supposedly checked uh, the mine that 3 a.m. that Monday morning and reported no gas in any section. In fact, uh, the newspaper reported that the bulletin board had been found near the entrance marked April 4, 2824, safe in bold letters. And it was signed by a man named J.T. Pyle, and we'll have more about him later. Some of the miners had not gone through the proper check-in procedure, more on that later as well, which made identification difficult. And the miners were just getting to work at their sites in the rooms that I showed you. They were putting on their overalls and their equipment. Some of them were still climbing out of the cars that had brought them there. So at 7.05 a.m., about 35 minutes after the morning shift had entered the mine, a pocket of methane gas exploded near the 8 North section of the mine. And the force of the explosion dislodged timber supports and caused roof collapses near the entrances and all over the mine. Witnesses outside felt the thud of the blast three blocks away, and they reported seeing uh, white smoke and a sheet of flame shoot from the mine entry. One miner's watch, as you can see in the diagram here, will stop at 7.04 a.m. Uh, this diagram shows where some of the bodies were found, and diggers in these rooms would use uh, shooting the coal face with black powder, which wasn't the ideal way to do things. And uh, they sprinkled water from a car to sort of suppress the gas and the, and the dust. We'll see more about that later. Coal dust trapped inside the mine was ignited, triggering a second, even more uh, devastating explosion, which forced a wall of fire through the shafts of the entire poorly ventilated mine. The heavy mine timbers were shattered into splinters, uh, allowing roof collapses everywhere, men who were not crushed by the uh, falling debris and the force of the violent explosions were burned to death and roof falls uh, occurred in almost every section of the mine. But uh, most of the miners probably were killed by something called after damp. You see fire damp was blamed for the explosion and then after damp is a deadly cocktail of toxic gases, primarily uh, carbon monoxide after the fire. A number of the dead miners were found with handkerchiefs over their faces in an attempt to block the after damp. And uh, 
they were unsuccessful. The mine inspector later speculated that had uh, the men been, been equipped with even simple gas masks, and this is in the wake of World War I, where gas masks were uh, used, and the, the mining gas masks were similar, uh, it may have saved uh, quite a few lives. The poisonous after damp uh, hindered the rescue effort, as you may imagine, as did the debris. Blockage near the main entrance and the secondary tunnel forced rescuers to look at a different site, and they went to the Browns Run air shaft that I mentioned earlier, uh, about a mile from the entry. So here in this chart, you can see an overview of the whole mine, and the air shaft is up there at the right with the arrow. And the place where most of the miners were trapped is down here at the bottom in section north, eight north. So we're talking a mile or more underground and, and it, it took rescuers quite a long time to get through all the tight spaces to get there. Here's a closer view of the air shaft. You can see the distance from North eight. And here's a diagram of the air shaft where you can see the stairs that the rescuers would use and in both parts of this diagram. Now on the surface above the, the shaft, they built this makeshift rope and pulley system, hopefully to be able to bring up uh, injured miners in, in, a, in a gurney, but uh, the one you see here is, is already deceased and, and in the end, that's all they were able to do. Would-be rescuers came from all over the place, including the Hitchman Mine, Blair, Ohio, the Richland Mine in Warwood, the Glendale Gas and Coal Mine, and the Williamson, West Virginia Mine, Bridgeport, Steubenville, Cincinnati, Ohio, Pittsburgh, PA. The LaBelle crew was on the scene, and uh, nurses from the American Red Cross, and a number of Wheeling physicians were there hoping to be able to treat miners as they rescued. You can see in some of these images from the Pittsburgh Post, uh, the doctors and nurses and rescuers. The rain and the mud made the three mile dirt road out to the air shaft at Brown's Run virtually impossible for any kind of mechanized transport. Automobiles were sliding in the mud to the side of the road and that made it more difficult for others to traverse the, the muddy terrain. And so they ended up using horse-drawn wagons and country sleds. And you can see one in this image, in this amazing series of images from the Baranowski family. Stanislaw Baranowski was one of the victims of the mine disaster. Here's another shot of a horse and wagon. Rescuers worked in teams, relay teams, every 750 feet. So they're pulling stretchers over broken rock and, and shattered timbers and twisted steel track from the cars. And they used at least 50 Burrell all-service gas masks, some of which you can see in this picture, and uh, self-contained oxygen breathing apparatus. And they were used to explore places where the percentage of oxygen was so low it would kill a human being. They actually took canaries into the mine to try to measure the methane, very old school. And a few of the canaries did die. An old miner told a newspaper reporter that miners welcomed rats because rats would not live in a mine that was full of methane. One of the rescuers from LaBelle, uh, when he came up through the air shaft, finally reported that he thought there was no hope. Um, the, um, during the first few days, there had been a, a school of thought that the, the veteran miners would lead the others to a place deeper in the mine so that they could create a barricade against the after damp. But in truth, things uh, went too quickly, as we'll see. Uh, one of the reports said that it took eight men, eight rescuers to carry one body, which indicates some of the grisly uh, things that were found that day. Again, with this chart from the position of the bodies, it appeared that most of the men had been, as I mentioned, at their workstations just getting there. And the ones, uh, many were stunned by the terrific concussion of the explosion and others were suffocated by the after damp. Um, one motorman had been found sitting on his motor car buried under an avalanche of slate. Looking at the diagram there, you can see 
with the gold arrows, various places where bodies were found. The scene outside the mine was one of wrenching grief and confusion. Women and children rushed to the site. Um, they were sobbing and asking for a word of their husbands, fathers, brothers, uncles. You can imagine the uh, grief. Wives of miners tried to bypass the barricades and some of them, uh, after learning, one woman after learning of her husband's death actually tried to uh, drown herself in the river and was rescued by onlookers. Uh, according to one report, Nuns who were canvassing the neighborhood looking for wives, widows after the disaster found a young and the quote unquote foreign woman in bed with child who had uh, recently married one of the miners and was unaware of the accident and wondering where her husband was. And they decided they weren't gonna tell her until the baby was born. Don't know what happened with that story. Relatives and friends kept a constant vigil outside the entrance in the drenching rain. At Brown's Run, they sat around fires waiting for word. When it was learned that men had suffocated by after damp, a, uh, the grief intensified and a moaning sound could be heard from a considerable distance, according to the newspaper. This is another image from the Baranowski family showing the encampments at Brown's Run. And this is another. In addition to the bereaved, uh, you had crowds of curious onlookers and reporters uh, who descended upon Benwood and were uh, standing behind hastily constructed barricades. At one point, 100 rescuer outfits were reportedly stolen by unscrupulous people who were posing as helpers. Mrs. Caroline uh, Melcher, age 68 of Jacob Street in Wheeling, was struck and killed by a speeding truck that was rushing supplies to the rescue teams. Early optimism soon waned as one dead body after another was carried from the mine. Excuse me, after a few days, the odor of decaying bodies became overwhelming for rescuers. Doctors started um, spraying the corpses with disinfectant. They were worried about infection because the condition of the dead bodies was often appalling and the after damp was thought to accelerate decomposition. Uh, bodies were too gruesome to describe and one gentleman had been, as the newspaper said it, uh, practically baked and swollen to twice his normal size. So it, it was horrific. And temporary morgues at Brown Run were set up in the fields under tents. Uh, one was even sent up in a men's washroom. And later a morgue was set up at Cooey Bent's uh, building where they had funeral services in addition to making furniture. Another morgue was at Blue Ribbon Hall in Benwood. Each corpse received a tag marked with the location in the mine where the body was found. Identification was slow, as you can imagine, uh, emotionally draining. Ethnic pe groups, people who were recent immigrants looking for family members gathered at these places to try and identify bodies at Blue Ribbon Hall. And they spoke to each other, as one reporter noted, not by the tongue, but by the language of the heart. The last of the bodies was removed by May 6th. Among the dead were two uh, pairs of fathers and sons, as well as five pairs of brothers, three pairs of cousins. And in one pit, as you can see here, they found two Italian brothers clasped together in their final moments, Rocco and Michael Capabianco. Rocco was employed by Ohio Valley General Hospital and had just started working in the mine with his brother. Uh, they had apparently tried to reach the entrance together to escape because they were found, as I said, clasped together 1,500 feet from their uh, dinner buckets, which they had left behind. They were said to have had heartbeats when they were found, but uh, they were deceased before they could get them to the surface. One of the Ohio rescuers, a man named James Forgey, found a body the, he identified by lantern light. Now you can imagine in the shaft, he's looking for bodies and he sees his own uncle, Walter Snedden, who had been like a father to him, he said, and he was not aware that his uncle was working that day. And uh, actually his cousin, Alexander Snedden was also among the dead. John Frank Jr. was to be married a week later
a man named Raphael Vitiello was in the mine for the first time in his life, having been persuaded by his father Samuel to accept a job in the mine, and both were killed. Uh, there was a letter found in a boarding house in Bob's Run that was written by one of the deceased miners. And the paper had the name wrong, so I, I think it was Domenico Cognini. And the letter read, and I'll read it with you. My dear wife and daughters, I have the home completed and will have it furnished so that when you come to this place, you will have everything just like a queen in Italy. We will have a little garden and we already have planted something that will be fine when it grows and you get to this country. I have been working extra and will have money to send you next payday. I am lonesome for you. And the sooner we can make arrangements that you come, the better I'd be pleased. The letter was found folded in an envelope, incomplete, and um, the family in Florence, Italy was expecting to travel in June. There was some intrigue, the so-called man of mystery, and I mentioned earlier Poyle, who was a fire boss. There was confusion about J.J. Boyle and Poyle. Uh, Pyle was actually a fire boss, but he was not killed in the mine. Uh, the man named Boyle, turns out, and they thought he worked for Secret Service. He was some kind of mine inspector from Monongahela, Pennsylvania, who had left Pittsburgh by train the night before, and his brother-in-law said he had said he did not want to go back to Benwood. So he was a bookkeeper and an auditor and uh, was there for some reason. Now, as I said, they, they confused him with this Pyle who was a fire boss and had done the inspection. According to Joey, uh, Jerome Pyle uh, was killed in a, a later mine explosion at Everettsville, West Virginia in 1927, April, where 111 miners were killed. Uh, so the man of mystery was actually Matthew V. Heron, and he was an inspector of some kind. Others escaped death through various kinds of good fortune. Dan Dubik was initially thought to have been among the dead because he had failed to remove his check from the mine entry board on a previous shift. He was not killed. Uh, another man who'd been playing poker the night before until the wee hours of the morning did not go to work that day, luckily for him. A man named uh, Walter Snyder uh, didn't continue to work at the mine after his pastor told him he had a premonition that there would be a mine explosion and that he would be killed. So he stopped working at the mine. Relief funds were set up and uh, for the widows and children of, at the Bank of Benwood. And uh, many of the local ethnic societies made contributions. And while some of the money did make it to the families in a, an extremely shameful act, William Leach and Joseph Ward, who were bank employees, embezzled a lot of the money, which was never recovered. They were caught and they were convicted and received sentences to the West Virginia Penitentiary at Moundsville. The Bank of Benwood never recovered from the scandal and closed. On a more productive note regarding relief and funding, the city of Wheeling donated money they raised money at the movie shows uh, locally. The, the Italian government donated money. In a touching story, the prisoners at the Ohio County Jail collected $13, which is about $200 in modern money. Uh, the last penny they had, said the newspaper. Steelworkers from Wheeling Corrugating and Martin's Ferry made donations of $500, which is $7,500. ,700. The Red Cross uh, did a lot of work, of course. Uh, there were 32 widowed women on one street in Benwood and um, a crying child, as the newspaper said, on every doorstep. Uh, in another uh, 60, 50 to 60 widows were found in South Wheeling in a two block radius. Um, Luckily, uh, and surprisingly, uh, you may find West Virginia had a workers' compensation law that ensured each widow $30 per month for life, which is about $445 a month today. They also receive $5 a year for each fatherless child until that child turns 16. <coughs> Excuse me. 
That's about $75 in modern money. Uh, it's not much. Wheeling Steel paid each widow a lump sum of $500, $7,500 total in, in modern dollars, and $150 for funeral expenses, which is about $2,000. So less than $10,000 for each life paid by the steel company. And it was, on that note, rather jarring to be looking through these newspapers for stories about uh, dead miners and their widows to see that uh, Wheeling Steel did quite nicely the quarter before that, um, making nearly a million dollars, which is 14 million in modern money. So I will make this editorial comment. In the end, it seems like these men were expendable, as they were all over the state, but particularly here because had some money been spent on safety and had this mine been a safer mine, this tragedy might have been uh, largely reduced or even avoided. Proper equipment would have cut into profits because it was more expensive than the kind that was in use. It was easier and cheaper for a company to go to New York and recruit new labor from Ellis Island. The day after their profits were reported, Wheeling Steel issued this expression of sympathy regarding the disaster. Um, but what of the would-be rescuers? Well, the hard labor in the foul air uh, made rescuers sick and exhausted, as you may imagine. One man accidentally drank disinfectant from a cup that he thought was coffee and had to be hospitalized. Members of the U.S. mine rescuer team uh, described this as the worst wreck mine they had ever seen. Bodies were uh, hurled in the air and blown with the force of a cannon against roofs or walls. Rescuers often had to reach in, you can imagine this, in these tight spaces where you, you can't stand, you're crawling to get through. And they're reaching around in the dark trying to find body parts. And then they're pulling these body parts for uh, hundreds of feet or even miles underground to the shaft, crawling over obstructions and dragging through tight spaces. So it was a harrowing and it had to be a traumatic experience for these rescuers as well. For their efforts, they were given by Wheeling Steel these uh, fobs. I have one myself, uh, which says on the front, Benwood Mine Explosion, April 28, 1924, and on the back, for exceptional service rendered to humanity, Wheeling Steel Corporation. Now, despite their efforts, uh, no one survived. 119 men in the end were killed. There was a lot of confusion about the numbers, but that is where we stand. And uh, there is this caveat that was provided to me by people who were coal miners or had family who mined coal. Uh, these men got paid by the weight of the coal that they put in their truck. And so they would often take extra help with them into the mine and the mine regulations were loose enough that, and they wanted to get their coal, so they allowed this to happen. And miners were supposed to place a tag, and that's how you identified them. If there was an explosion like this, you could see who was in and who wasn't in. But these people uh, often took uh, maybe a son, maybe a cousin, or a new brother right off the boat to go in and help to get more coal into the cart, and they didn't have tags, so... How many people were actually killed in Benwood and other mine disasters, we may never know. That's one of the problems. The safety epilogue, uh, R.M. Lambie, who was the state mine inspector, uh, filed his report and he said that Benwood was not a safe mine, basically. Uh, they did not use approved electric cap lamps. They used open lamps, which could cause a fire, an explosion. They did not use explosion-proof motors. They did not use permissible explosives. They used black powder, as I mentioned before. Not the best thing. Uh, they did not have safety masks, as you see in the, in the uh, picture. And they did not practice proper rock dusting. He emphasized that point as well. Some of these things did start to occur in the wake of the Benwood disaster. If there's anything that, uh, that, good ca that came of it, we can say that. Benwood still ranks as the third worst mining disaster in West Virginia, which you can imagine has quite a number of them, including Monaga, which in 1907 killed 362 men, uh, roughly half of them, more than half or less than half were Italian immigrants. And this is the worst mining disaster in the history of the country. And there's Eccles and then there's Benwood. Um, and Everettsville is the one I mentioned earlier. 
An overwhelming number of the dead miners at Benwood were recent immigrants from Eastern Europe, mostly Poland, Southern Europe, mostly Italy, Greece, uh, Hungary, Lithuania, Ukraine, Russia. You can see the numbers there. As you can imagine, uh, Benwood and South Wheeling, where a lot of these men were from, saw funeral after funeral for days. Many of the deceased were Catholics who belonged to St. John's Church in Benwood. Excuse me, most of these men were buried at Mount Calvary. You can see the famous image I referred to earlier there. Uh, on May 5th, uh, 1924, 24 victims were buried side by side at Mount Calvary. This is a close up of that famous photograph where services were conducted in English, Polish, and Italian. According to the newspaper, the bodies were uh, kept under tents. They were concerned about infection again, and they were then interred, uh, many of them side by side or on top of each other because they work together in pairs. This is what the newspaper said. Here's a seldom seen image from the diocese collection, which shows that same uh, funeral from a different angle and another image showing after the funeral. This is what it looks like today at that site. Unidentified dead miners were, who were burned beyond recognition were buried in a grave at Greenwood, a mass grave. The Catholics who were later identified by process of elimination because there was no DNA or anything, were moved to Mount Calvary. Many like the Greek miners remain buried at Greenwood. Here you see the tombstone of James Angelakis at Greenwood. 14 of the 15 Greek miners are buried side by side there. And uh, the other one, is this gentleman who has a tombstone. They're the only two. Four of the Greek miners were said to have been classmates on the island of Crete. And uh, anyone who isn't buried or at Greenwood or Mount Calvary is buried at a cemetery around the Ohio Valley. I think it humanizes these men to see their faces. Uh, to the extent that I have pictures, they come from tombstones, so they're not the best pictures, but many of them are poignant, like this young man, uh, Jan Pischewitz, who was only 16 years of age when he was killed. And it is a heartbreaking story of his family uh, who emigrated from uh, Galatia, a part of Poland, in 1907 when this young man was an infant. His father was also a coal miner, his father Lucas then started working at Wheeling Steel and uh, faithfully took his family to Benwood. And he died, the father, on April 9th, 1924. So only 20 days, 19 days before the accident, he died of a heart inflammation. And then Jan, Jan died in the mine and his brother, uh, Stanley, who was working for Wheeling Steel, fell off a truck two years later, struck his head, fractured his skull, and was killed at the age of 16 as well. Here's another Polish miner. Now, loaders were the men who put, this is the lowest skilled job in the mine, according to most uh, reports, uh, loaded the cars with coal. And a timber man was a man who cut and set timbers to hold up the roof and hold up the walls. Motormen, of course, drove the carts. And then trip riders were the brakemen. They were the assistants to the motormen. Here's one of Vitielli uh, brothers. And here's Giuseppe Ria from, it was a World War I veteran. A few of them were. I don't have pictures of all of them, as I mentioned. Here's another Italian miner who was 21. And another, uh, probably the oldest miner at age 50. Pasquale Fana uh, was married to Joey Telatochi's uh, great grandmother. And uh, he was a track man. And they're the ones who literally laid the rail track that you saw and ma maintained it. He was also an Italian immigrant, and uh, if he had not been killed, uh, Joey would not exist. And so that's how this accident was life-changing for uh, Joey and a lot of other people. This is Joey's, another of his great-grandfathers, a Hungarian loader named Istvan, Istvan Vargo. We mentioned him earlier. Here's a Croatian cutter. Cutters were the ones who literally cut the rooms and made passageways to the hallway areas. Here's another loader from Croatia and another. Now, 
The historical marker was placed finally near um, where the mine explosion occurred. And this, this happened in 2009, and Joey was a big part of that as well. Here's a close-up of the marker that you can see. And finally, um, this committee, chaired by um, Joe Telatochi and uh, Susan Riley at Moundsville Library, uh, which raised the money, 130000 120000 plus 30000 in uh, donations from contractors to build the memorial. So on September 27th, 2014, the Benwood Mine Disaster Memorial was finally dedicated at Boggs Run. If you go and see it today, it has all the names of those killed. So with that, uh, that uh, completes the historical part of the program. And I would, if Kara would remove me from the screen, I would like to show you a tribute that I created for the 119th souls. So here it is.
was early this morning. He passed by these houses on his way to the coal. He was tall, he was slender, and his dark eyes so tender. His occupation was mining West Virginia, his home. It was just before 12 I was feeding the children. Then Mosley came running to bring us the news. Number eight is all flooded, many men are in danger. And we don't know their number, but we fear they're all dead. So I picked up the baby and I left all the others to comfort each other and pray for our own. There is Timmy, 14, and there's John, not much younger. Their own time soon will be coming to go down the black hole. Oh, if I had the money to do more than just feed them, I'd give them good learning, the best could be found. So when they grow up, they'd be checkers and wires, and not spend their time drilling in the dark underground. Now what can I say to his poor little children? Or what can I tell his old mother at home? Or what can I say to my heart that's clear broken? To my heart that's clear broken if my darling is gone. Say, did you see him growing so early this morning? He walked by your houses on his way to the cold. He was tall, he was slender, and his dark eyes so tender. His occupation was mining West Virginia, his home. So that's my tribute, and that concludes the program. Um, very sad, and hopefully we've learned from it. And uh, I'm happy to to try to answer questions if you have any. I'm not an expert on mining, but uh, I've been corrected in one pronunciation: Eccles rhymes with heckles. Well, Bonnie Thurston, who. Grew up in a mine camp, as I understand it. So if you have questions about mining, she's here with us. So thanks everyone for attending and um, I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much, Mr. Duffy. Um, thank you to all who are watching and all who have um, attended the series throughout the summer. Um, we're already looking forward to next year, as I said. Um, if you're joining us from the Lunch with Books page, um, check out Cockane's page as well. So we are Cockane at Glendale on Facebook. Um, we are The Cockane Farmstead on YouTube. Um, and you'll have uh, up some updates about what we're planning in the future um, and what's going on. If you've never heard of Cockane or you've never been to Cockane, um, we're in Glendale, right across from John Marshall High School. Um, it's a 1950s farmhouse um, that has not been updated since the 1890s. Um, so we're here Monday through Friday, 10 to 4. Um, we'll give you a tour anytime you stop by um, and you can see what it's all about. Um, so thank you, Mr. Duffy, again, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. <laughs>